Good morning, good morning. Good morning, uh, Teresa, Liz, Olivia. And whoever else might be watching. Nick, possibly. Hey, Nick, uh, by the way, too, if you're listening, uh, did you get my, I sent you a text message through mes uh, Facebook Messenger with some suggestions for verses. Uh, just so I, just in case you didn't and you're watching this, I was thinking that uh, how Peter had, uh, had uh, messed up and that he had uh, done something against Jesus and uh, needing repentance uh, as a good uh, forefront for somebody who's made a mistake, but how Peter afterwards uh, in John uh, 21, 15 through 17, was forgiven by Jesus in a, in a famous passage about uh, uh, Simon by Soma, if you, love, if you do you love me? And he comes back with feed my sheep, that passage there. And a couple other ones was John 13, 35 and 15, 10 through 13, I thought might be nice passages for what you were talking about. Okay, put that out of the way. And so let's say a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time. I get to look into the Word and get some more information about you and uh, your, and the things that uh, uh, you try to show us through your Word. And we give you all the praise and thanks. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So, time for a flood. Uh, probably a very disappointing time for God. Uh, it's not something he wanted to do, but it was necessary to uh, to correct an error uh, that was uh, that had been that happened. And so, let's take a look at this. And for our backdrop, of course, we'll have our yard arc. And we're going to start off here in verse twelve. We left off yesterday, and I already got my pointer. Hey, I'm ahead of schedule. <laughs> okay. I don't think this is going to run very long. It's not as long as uh, I was trying to decide if I was going to go into Chapter 8 a little bit, but uh, the way it works out, this one might be a little bit on the short side, but we'll see. And it rained upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. 40 days and 40 nights. What an interesting number. Because it actually is used a few times. And it's a number that seems always associated with some kind of punishment or, or pending uh, uh, judgment by God. And I guess a couple other times. Uh, during Moses' time up on Mount Sinai, uh, if you remember, Exodus 24, 18. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and get him up into the mount. And Moses was in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. Deuteronomy 9.25. Thus I fell down before the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. As I fell down at the first because the Lord had said he would, would destroy you. And uh, it was interesting, uh, you know, the Exodus version. You remember what happened now? Because Moses was up there so long that the people got a little antsy, built an uh, idol and was worshiping it. Uh, so uh, then the spies trip to Cana in Numbers 13, 23 through 25. Of interest about the mighty men, the, those graves were so large it took two men to carry them. Uh, but uh, here we've got another incident of 40 days. And they came upon the brook of Eschor and cut, and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes. And they bear it between two upon a staff. A cluster, one cluster of grapes that took two people to carry. That's big. I remember we were talking about this whole gene pool issue and how it could, there was, it mentioned that uh, we had mighty men and it, uh, before and after the flood, that there was still some, uh, some uh, contamination of the gene pool even after uh, when Moses, I mean, most likely Satan did it again prior to Joshua's whole uh, uh, period of time. But here we see in Numbers, this cluster of grapes that was huge. That was, uh, it was not only expected people, but I think we've all heard of a GMO uh, type uh, of uh, food. You see that label, non-GMO? 
Well, that's uh, that stands for. Uh, uh, I'm thinking. I'm thinking of the wrong term. Not the GMO. Oh, what's that term? It's about a manipulation of the uh, of the. Because uh, uh, even plants have a DNA, and it's about a manipulation of their uh, of their DNA basically to make them grow larger or grow or be more. Uh, oh, what's that term? I can't think of it. Now it's going to bug me. Go look it up. Genetically modified organism, <laughs> GMO. It's where they try to modify the seeds of plants to make them grow bigger uh, and have more of a uh, yield. And But it's actually, they're finding that, that it can cause problems. But continuing here in numbers, the place was called the Brook Eschor because of the cluster of grapes which the children of Israel cut down from fence. And they returned from the searching of the land after 40 days. And it's 40 days again. <clears throat> and your children shall wander in the wilderness 40 years and bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. So there's that 40 years they wandered in the wilderness because they didn't listen to the Lord. Uh, that was the next 40. And the next 40, and the Lord's anger was kindled against Israel and he made them wander in the wilderness 40 years until all the generation that had done evil in the sight of the Lord was consumed. So this 40 seems to have a, a judgment attached to it. Kind of interesting. And we jump over to 1 Kings 19.8. This is Elijah's miraculous journey to Sinai. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of the meat 40 days and 40 nights under Herb, the Mount of God. Now the thing that happened there was that Elijah was actually uh, uh, did that whole thing with the uh, uh, those priests uh, where he... Uh, where he's heading the horde of the Mount of God that, uh, to do that thing uh, to prove to the uh, uh, those Baal worshippers that their God didn't exist. So that was another judgment because they were actually killed. And the last one is actually Jesus in Mark 1.13. <clears throat> and he was there in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered unto him. So kind of a fascinating tidbit. It's funny how even even things like numbers can have meaning. I think we've uh, this, the number seven has a huge meaning in the Bible. It's the meaning of completion. Uh, the number six as a, as the uh, number of man. So that uh, the kind of things to watch watch out for to kind of give you a little hint of certain things. Okay, so jumping back into the ark, my little side trip. Verse 13, in the selfsame day entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them into the ark. They and every beast after his kind and all the cattle after their kind and every creepy thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind and every fowl after his kind and every bird of every sort. They went in unto the Noah, into the ark, two of two of all flesh, wherein there is breath of life. When I get to that, I'm going to kind of show some interesting things about why only the land animals, all the fish lived. And they, and they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had, <coughs> had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. Good water, by the way. You guys enjoying it too? I thought it might be uh, not taste so great since of the fitness water, but I like it. So according to the Bible, uh, talking about being able to fit, and that's the that's the age old question that people always ask. 
uh, is how did Miller fit all these animals in? Well, number one, realize that the animals, it's only of each kind. Like for instance, you only need one pair of cats from the cat family because they have all the genes in them to produce every single cat there is, whether they be small cats like we have in our houses or big cats like they're out in Africa. But the gene behind that cat is the same. So that all you have to have is each kind, not each species, but each kind. And we see that spelled out there. So that, uh, and like dogs, you only need one set of dogs. Probably, they probably picked a, me a medium sized dog. Uh, and so they could do small dogs and big dogs and, and through and through time uh, that they would develop all the different breeds we have now. That's an example. The other thing is, is people go, well, what about elephants and uh, rhinoceroses and giraffes? Well, realize that uh, those animals get big as adults, but that they really don't have to take an adult with them. All they have to do is take a, uh, they don't want to take a baby either because the baby needs its mother for, uh, for nourishment. But as soon as they're weaned, uh, they're still fairly small, believe it or not. Uh, even even elephants, uh, you ever seen a baby elephant after it's weaned, it's not very big. It's probably, oh, well, it's the size of a good sized dog, uh, but it's not like the size of a, a regular elephant. And there's very few that they said, if you really look at all animals, most of them are really small. And at the average, if you average them all out, that most animals fit into the size of about a sheep or a large dog. Uh, so. So you figure there was about 16,000 animals uh, on, on the ark. And when they plan that all out, uh, based on, they, you know, we transplant animals all the time on ships now. So it's easy enough to figure out. So let me bring in this next picture here. Cross section of the ark. I think I showed this to you once before. And it said it had three floors. So, so you got one floor here. Uh, you got the floor here. And you got the next floor here. And then you get the next floor here. And they're saying that uh, when you divide the 45 feet, that you could actually fit a little subfloor in between if you needed to. So when you do that, you end up with, uh, I thought I had a number, but I guess I don't. It, you end up with a lot of space. And so they're basically assuming they required approximately the same floor space as animals in typical farm enclosures and laboratories today. The vast majority of creatures, birds, reptiles, and mammals are small. The largest animals were probably only a few hundred pounds of body weight. And it's still necessary to take account for the floor space required by large animals such as elephants, giraffes, rhinos, and some dinosaurs. But even those collectively do not require a large area. A God would likely have sent to Noah young and therefore small, but not newborns, representing of these kinds so that they would have a full reproductive potential for the life after the flood to repopulate the earth. Even the largest dinosaurs were relatively small when only a few years old. So without tearing of cages, then only 40% of the ark floor would have been necessary. Uh, so uh, give you an idea, there's some pictures of the, uh, of what it might look like inside the ark with the different cages. Uh, some of this stuff comes from Noah's ark, uh, the, uh, the actual life-size version of the ark in Kentucky. And I so want to go visit it. Let's give you an idea of how much room is really inside. Now, there's a lot of room. What's more, many could have been housed in groups, which would have further reduced the required size, like animals that, that are willing to live near each other. There'd be some that would eat each other if you put them together. But I'm sure Noah figured all that out. And so what about the provisions for the animals? Uh, so 40%, 47% of the ark, they figured, was for the animals. And then uh, for the food for the animals, somewhere around six to 12% uh, food and water for the animals. And then about another nine, uh, uh, 6% for food and another 9% for water. And so when you add that all up, so even though that what we see here, it's only about 68% of the arc was necessary for what ended up on there. There could have been room for many more people. Uh, and that's my point here is that uh, uh, during that 120 years, can you imagine it now? Uh, you got, can you imagine the reporters? And I won't, I won't bet they even had some kind of reporting system even then, uh, report interviews. So why are you building this ark? Uh, and so uh, you say it's going to flood. Uh, what's a flood? 
And, uh, you know, I could see because it didn't even rain that, that during that time frame. Uh, things were wadded by a mist on the ground, like fog almost. And so, uh, so I can imagine some of the people, the naysayers, walking around laughing at them and stuff. Uh, so for 120 years, Noah's building this ark. He's already over 600 years old when he's building it. <clears throat> but he's also a preacher of righteousness, as we found out in our prior lesson. And so he's actually preaching to people that God is going to flood the earth once I finish this ark. Uh, I'm sure after the fact that many people are thinking, why, I wish he would have taken more time to build that ark. But uh, uh, <laughs> but, but this, the first thing that comes to my mind is the fact that nobody believed him. Uh, and so the only people that ended on that ark was Noah and his family. Uh, whatever, what, whatever happened to cause that level of evil, I believe it was due to the sons of God who fell uh, that caused this. I've heard that due to the interbreeding of the fallen angels, maybe what we know today is disembodied demons. Just, uh, angels live forever, uh, so that even the fallen angels live forever. Well, if they were, if they impregnated uh, human women, is it possible that their offspring, even though they died, that their spirits would be still uh, alive because they were mated with a an angel. And I often wonder if that could be what the disembodied spirits are that we see in the Bible. So I thought I'd just point to a few of those. You remember uh, <coughs> that some of those disembodied demons, I don't believe that those are fallen angels because angels are, uh, they seem to have their own body uh, as we see with uh, Gabriel and Michael and different different angels we hear about, Satan. But these disembodied demons seem to be a different category. Uh, they don't seem to have a body because they're always trying to find a body to live in. And if you remember the story of Mary, uh, Mary uh, Magdala, over in Mark 16, 9, it mentions, Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils out of her. Uh, remember that story? And then uh, the most famous one, there was like over a thousand demons inside the, uh, the, Gorgine, the Gorgine's demonic over in Matthew 8, 28. Now, fresh our memory here. And this is uh, Jesus uh, was coming uh, to this area. And when he was come to the other side in the country of the Gorgizanins, there met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs, exceedingly fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. It seemed like whenever they were, in, uh, it even talks about that they broke chains. Uh, and so they had superhuman strength uh, with those demons in, uh, embodying them. And behold, they cried out saying, what have we to do with thee, Jesus, the son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? They knew exactly who Jesus was. And there was a good way off from them a herd of many swine feeding so the devils besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, suffer us to go into the herd of swine. See, they want to embody something, so they can't. They, uh, they don't like being out outside of a body. And he said unto them, Go. And when they had come, were come out, they went into the herd of swine, and behold, the whole herd of swine ran valiantly down a steep place into the sea and perished in the waters. A couple of interesting things there is at first they had to ask permission of Jesus, who's God, uh, that uh, if they could leave those, uh, they could leave that body and go into another body. Because right? it gives us a big clue that demons aren't allowed to do things without God's permission. Uh, so that uh, if you ever get in a situation where you feel like you're being uh, being tormented by a demon or uh, feel evilness near you, that you can always call on the name of the Lord to protect you, and He will. Uh, the demons feared Jesus uh, quite a bit. <laughs> so as we see that some of those who did, so as we see that some of those who did this issue, we see in Genesis six are in chains. And remember in Jude six it mentions this. Uh, so it's some of these that uh, that actually performed this evil act back in Genesis six are in chains in darkness, and so they're still alive. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, yet hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness until the judgment of the great day. 
So they can't be roaming the earth. Uh, there is so much happening in the spirit world that I think we have no idea how much God is restraining at the moment. And he will unleash during the tribulation. Uh, got a hint of this over in Revelation 12, 12. This is when, uh, uh, therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you having great wrath, because he know that he has but a short time. Up until now, Satan has been relatively mild uh, because he's been under the control of Satan. And I think the one thing that happens uh, during the first seal of Revelation 6 is that basically Satan is given free reign to do whatever he wants. He wants that so bad he can taste it. Uh, and that God is going to finally allow him to do whatever he wants. And so I think that's what that means by that first uh, horseman uh, that heads out and the, and the, uh, uh, the Antichrist uh, comes on the scene. Because that... That's a little bit of speculation, but there's a lot of verses that support that. This part here in Revelation 12, 12 is talking about the three and a half year mark when Satan himself is thrown out of heaven and is not allowed to be in heaven anymore. Right now he's allowed to go there, I believe, and actually uh, and actually speak to God directly and complain about us, basically, uh, and ask permission for things, be able to torment people and do, and do all the things that we found out, like in Job, uh, that uh, Satan actually went and asked permission uh, to do those things. Okay, back to Genesis 7, 17. And the flood was 40 days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bare up the ark, and it was lifted up above the earth. And the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark went up upon the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. I love that verse right there, and I'm going to get back to that there in a second. I used to think something totally different until I read some, and now it makes perfect sense to me. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. Uh, that's about 15, that's 15 by about 20. A cubit is somewhere between 18 and 21 inches. So at 20 inches, that would be about 30 feet above the uh, tops of the mountains. And, and, and I used to say to myself, well, think about the highest mountain there is. And it happens to be uh, Mount Everest at 26,000 feet. Uh, and I always thought to myself that I know that to climb Mount Everest, when you get near the top, you actually have to have oxygen to breathe because uh, it's so high that I think it's I think it's above like about 21,000 feet that we uh, we it's very high for us to breathe. And when you get up to about uh, uh, 26,000 feet, you need oxygen to actually breathe, even if you're in really good shape. So I read an article that realized. That's based on the fact that you're 26,000 feet above sea level. And I was reading an article realizing that uh, if sea level goes up, then obviously the air, air goes up with it. Uh, the air stays on top of it. So if the water is at 20, 26,000 feet, then the air up there is, uh, is the same as it would be at sea level. And so I, I used to say to myself, how could the ark be up there for almost a year? How would they breathe? Uh, they need oxygen, and that they couldn't carry it with them. So I used to think that maybe that's why the, the Lord had them uh, uh, basically tar the, in, uh, the inside and the outside, was that the air on the inside of the ark actually helped them to breathe when they got that high. But it didn't matter because it, uh, it didn't need it for breath. That was probably just to keep it watertight. Uh, but that the, uh, that the air went up with it. So it didn't matter whether the water was at sea level it is now or sea level above the mountains. It was still sea level. And so we can breathe just fine at sea level. So now I feel much better that uh, the ark had no problem going that high. Some people try to say that mountains like Mount Everest weren't there, uh, that all the mountains were really a lot lower. But you can see in this verse here, it does say there were mountains and the mountains were covered. Doesn't say how high they were, but there was definitely mountains. So it wasn't like the earth was flat or anything. And I often thought to myself, well, you know, uh, as the water is rising, what if somebody could make a raft and try to ride it up uh, as, the, as the water got deeper and deeper and deeper? And uh, but realize we're going to talk about it here. When we, uh, we get going here at the end. 
and into the next chapter, that this, uh, basically, the water was on the earth almost 10 months. So even if they had a little raft they could get on uh, and rode it up, what are they going to eat? Uh, there's nothing, uh, all the vegetation was gone. There was nothing left. Uh, unless you got real lucky and found some fish swimming up that high, uh, probably with that much water, it would be hard to find a fish. And so even if you managed to build an ark real quick, and I figured this, uh, it probably flooded the earth uh, within within 20 or 30 days. So we're talking fast. Uh, and it does say, we, we're going to read the verse, that God does verify that everyone died. Uh, no one lived except the people in the ark. So I was thinking, what if I was the guy who got, who made a mistake and got stuck on the outside? Uh, if I could if I could make a raft fast enough, maybe I could survive. But uh, being a, almost a year uh, with, no, with nothing to eat and... Uh, the water would have been salty, most likely. It could have been. It could have been drinkable, maybe, uh, but uh, uh, it would be salty. So you'd end up dying from the, the amount of salt intake. So you're not going to make it either way. I know. Sometimes I think about weird things. <clears throat> Okay, moving on. Uh, just a verse over in Psalms to kind of support this whole thing going on here. Thou covest it with the deep as with a, gar a garment. The water stood above the mountains. So it's just a psalm that also confirms this uh, verse. Oh, and I, I thought also to, to mention a couple other things uh, that I was curious too on uh, this whole survivability thing. Uh, if it was possible that uh, 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 somebody could, show, what's the longest somebody has ever treaded water? Uh, and actually, the Guinness Book of World Records puts a man treading water at 85 hours. That's a long time, or well, three and a half days, but not even close to almost a year before the water subsided. When Noah left the ark, uh, with Noah left the ark. We see that in Genesis 7:11. Uh, it says here that uh, in the 600th year of Noah's life. In the second month, okay, remember the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day where all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened, okay? And so when we jump ahead to Genesis 8, 13, we'll get to tomorrow. It's going to say in the, and here it says that it came to pass in the 600th and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month, so that, so that the 600th year, the second month, to the 601st year, to the first month, that's 11 months. The first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth, and Noah removed the covering off the ark, and looked, and behold, the face of the earth, uh, of the ground was dry. And he, and so it was about a year uh, to the day. And based on when you jump down to verse 8, 5, and the waters decreased continually until the 10th month, the 10th month on the first day of the month, were the tops of the mountains seen. So it took about 10 months to even see the top of the mountains. So even if somebody managed to try to figure out a way to, uh, to survive, I can't see somebody surviving without uh, 10 months without food and water. So just some things that I, I was thinking about, I would show that the Bible even covered that stuff. Okay, verse 21. All, and, all, and here God confirms it though. Uh, and all flesh died that moved upon the earth both of fowl and of cattle and of beast and every creepy thing that creepeth upon the earth. And, and every man, let me just, uh, and, and all in whose nostrils was the breath of life for all that was in the dry land died. I want to mention something about this, uh, this whole idea of, and cattle and beast and every creepy thing that creepeth upon the earth. I found it fascinating that God seemed to intentionally want to make sure that all the animals died also. And I think it's based on some verses that uh, you see in Leviticus. And you got to realize something that uh, I think most decent people don't think this kind of stuff goes on. But there's a lot of strange things out there that happen uh, that uh, behind closed doors that people don't really know about. And it's starting to come out more and more in public. 
And when I was researching this a little bit, I found some rather disturbing things about things with what people call normal these days. So I can see the Sodom and Gomorrah uh, really coming into play, or uh, the days of Noah. And I think that's part of the reason he had to kill the animals too. And you're going to see here in Leviticus that God made some rules about animals. So in Leviticus 18.23, Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself with, therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down there unto. It is confusion. And jumping over to Leviticus 20, 15, and 16. If any man lie with a beast, he shall surely be put to death, and he shall slay the beast. And if a woman approach unto any beast and lie down there unto, thou shalt kill the woman and the beast, and they shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. So you can see here that, uh, to me, this sounds like some kind of human uh, uh, animal mixture of, uh, of genome, of uh, trying to produce something that's uh, both human and animal at the same time. They call that chimera. Uh, it's where you try to uh, use uh, animal uh, DNA to produce something, or use human DNA in an animal to make something that is... Uh, uh, a combination of the two and they are doing this now uh, particularly in countries that don't have any rules against it uh, they call it chimera and I think they're doing it for for a good reason for medical science reasons they actually hope to be able to uh, actually produce human organs inside animals for transplant purposes uh, I'm sure glad I got a human heart because I uh, I never really thought about it at the time. I was a little uh, ignorant in uh, some of this stuff. Uh, my eyes are open now, uh, but that uh, if I got offered a, uh, uh, a organ that was grown inside of an animal, I think I would have to refuse it based on these verses. So that might be why God had to destroy the animals too, that a lot of weird things were going on during this time frame, not just with humans, but with animals too. The fish, though, were all survived, so I guess nothing happened with them. Let's see. Okay. Almost done here. I am. Uh, thought it was going to be short. I guess not. So just remember that, uh, uh, as we saw uh, in uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, that God actually uh, destroyed the whole city for doing... Uh, unnatural acts with uh, uh, between uh, uh, I hate saying these words on a public forum like this but uh, I think you know where I'm driving at you know why Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed and it had to do with a culture that uh, seems okay nowadays but uh, uh, I can see that we're heading the US is heading in that same direction as Sodom and Gomorrah and, and someday that America is going to judge uh, God is going to judge America, I think, in the same way. So I think we're definitely in that place Jesus warns us about as in the days of Noah. So we see that. This is a refresher over Matthew 24, 37 to 39. But as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. I think the destruction, and once it happens, of course, we'll be out of here. All of, his, all of us born-again Christians who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and have accepted him as our Savior. I'm almost, I say that that way because I, I think there's a lot of people that sense that if you're just a good person, uh, you're going to get into heaven. And that's not necessarily the case. There's going to be a lot of surprised good people that uh, don't realize that they have to have a relationship with the Lord in order to get to heaven. So moving on, verse 22. All those with nostrils was the breath of life, and all that was in the dry land died. And every living substance was destroyed which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and creepy thing, and followed the heaven. And they were destroyed from the earth, and Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed upon the earth 150 days. I just have a side note here at the end here. Uh, it's interesting that uh, we use this verse to prove something of interest uh, when it comes to 
uh, the, the calendar year, currently we, our calendar year is 365 and a quarter days, plus or minus a few minutes. And that uh, it used to be that uh, based on this verse, we can tell this verse and another verse, that we can tell that it used to be a 360 day year. Let me just read through this. So you see here, the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. When you compare Genesis 7 11, the 600th year of Noah's life in the second month, the 17th day of the month. Okay, so you this, the second month to the 17th day of the month, and then you jump to Genesis 8, 4. And the ark rested on the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month upon the Mount of Ararat, which is five months. So 150 days in the five months gives us 30 day months. And there's two things that happen in history that makes, it, makes me believe that it could be why uh, the year got longer. There's two events that happened that God actually changed time, uh, at least when it comes to the orbit of the earth. And one was called the Long Day of Joshua. Uh, and it's in Joshua 10 through 14. I mean, Joshua 10, verse 12 through 14. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand still. Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. Av and the sun stood still, and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven, and has not to go down about a whole day. So basically the earth stopped in orbit. Because <laughs> the sun didn't move. And there was no day like that before it or after it, that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. And there's one other incident too that happened uh, that could have added to this also. And it was uh, an issue where... Uh, it was requested to prove that a prophecy was going to come true, and it was requested that the sundial be retracted 10 degrees. This is Isaiah 38, 8. Behold, I will bring again the shadow of the degrees which has gone down in the sundial of Ahaz, 10 degrees backward, so that the sun returned 10 degrees by which degrees it was gone down. So basically, God made it so that the uh, earth actually backed up, uh, so that the sundial moved 10 degrees. Now, because of these two things, that might have been what caused the Earth to extend its orbit. Uh, that's speculation. It's not spelled out. But we do have some proof that the, uh, it was till about 700 B.C. Uh, that, the Earth, that the year was about 360 days long. And something caused it uh, between uh, creation and 700 B.C. as when they, when they re that we find evidence that the calendars were, uh, were changed to 365 days a year. So I guess I'd throw that little bit in there. And that will be it for today. I hope you enjoyed that lesson. And let me uh, say a prayer. Oh, dear Heavenly Father. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you so much uh, for this uh, lesson we got here. And these little insights into uh, things that we need to pay attention to even today, Lord, that we need to look to you for our guidance in all matters and that, uh, that we can, uh, through prayer and through uh, reading of your word, that we can learn more about what, what you see as good and what you see as evil. Help us to see that, Lord, and uh, give us, we praise you and we thank you so much. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So I'll see you guys all tomorrow. Have a good day. And, uh, I hope that uh, uh, that was a blessing and always for me.